and it turned out that God used that or something they said or then you can speak into their lives and you can believe things. Of us, we have a special treat today. Uh, I've gotten to know um, a new friend and a, 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 a wonderful man of God who loves Jesus. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the Lord and about ministry and about the Word of God. And when we get going, we can't stop. And uh, I have asked him to come and share with all of you today what the Lord is speaking to his heart. And I'm asking you to help me to join and welcome a good and dear friend, Pastor Tom Gu from Mount Airy Full Gospel Church. Would you welcome my friend? told me to make sure you know where the clock is so you get out of here early. <laughs> Amen. Hey, you know, I just left Mattery Full Gospel Church, and I want to tell you, uh, I'm so glad to be here, and um, if, uh, am I, like, feeding back on you? You want me to keep lowering this thing? Make it higher? People are grimacing. Okay. Anyway, I wanted to uh, bring the blessings from Mallory for Gospel Church to you. Um, I preached a sermon there this morning, not the same one I preach, I'm preaching here. Uh, I felt like that guy in that Hertz commercial or something where he jumps out and he runs uh, to get to the car or something. I, I, I finished up there at about 12.10 and uh, ran out, got in my car, told him goodbye, and uh, they said good riddance, and I... Uh, <laughs> got up here, and so I'm just so glad to be here. I, uh, I, I want to take an opportunity. Now, I told, I told Joey and some other folks um, that I normally uh, preach like expository type stuff, and uh, the sermon I'm going to do this morning, or this afternoon now, um, it would take me like three weeks to do it in our church. Uh, so I'm going to do it in one service, uh, uh, 45, 50, 55, 65, I don't know how many minutes, but we're going to do it in one service, and, uh, and I just want you to bear with me, and, uh, and we'll love each other before I leave, and, uh, and I will, uh, I, uh, I just want to, uh, I actually, I told Joey, I said, you know, I normally don't use my notes, but I'm going to have to here, because I want to make sure I don't start wandering around and, and whatever. And he said, that's okay, just stay right there where you are and don't move and everything will be okay. So <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be sharing with you, and by the way, let me make one important announcement, and I'm very serious about this. Um, I'm in your church. I'm in Joey's church. And if I say something that's contrary to what you know Joey teaches or something that's contrary to your do Joey's doctrine, then I, I really mean this. I just want you to forget what I say and then let Joey clean it up uh, a little bit later. No, I'm serious. And uh, when Joey gets to heaven, he can repent. And no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So anyway, all right. I, I'm going to talk about the Word of God. And, uh, and I know that am I, I can take that. If this is a problem, I'll take a handheld. What's he want me to do? Well, I'll take a handheld. That way. Anyway, if you have your Bibles, you can turn them to Matthew chapter 13. But I want, I want to lay a little bit of groundwork with some other things real quick. Number one, I'm going to talk about the Word of God. Uh, the Word, the Scripture tells us, and we don't have to put it up on the screen because I know you guys know the Word of God. The Word is, is powerful. It's sharper than it to it. just sword, able to divide it between the soul and the spirit. Jesus Christ said the Word. This is important for you, though, for what I must say. The word, he said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. They're spirit and life. Peter, though, and this isn't part of my sermon. This just goes along. You can take up an extra offering later. But this is in 1 Peter. Peter says something that's really interesting. Peter says, in 1 Peter 1.23, he says, Having been born again, 
Everybody here, if you're, if you're saved, you've been through this. He said, you've been, you are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, and we could say incorruptible seed, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now, what he, Peter is saying there is that the word of God is an incorruptible seed. That means it never gives out. It's always alive. It's all, but the word is a seed of God. The, the word seed, and I'm not here to teach you Greek because I don't know Greek, but the, the word, word, uh, the word seed means sperma, S-P-E-R-M-A. That is the life-giving substance for creation. And it's saying that the, the, the word of God has the ability to give life to us if something happens. And I'm going to tell you what that is this morning. Because if this is true, and it is true, that the word is alive, the sharp and ready to edge a sword, Jesus said, the words I speak, their spirit and their life. Peter says, it is the life-giving source. If those things are true, my question is, why is the church in such a miserable condition today? My, wor- my, my, my question is, what has happened if this is true, that the word has such power? What is it? What is it that's going on in life today? Is there something wrong with this word? Of course not. The Word of God is alive. There is nothing wrong with the Word. Why? Because it's the Word of God. God never changes. The Word of God never changes. And therefore, there's nothing wrong with the Word. That means there has to be something wrong with something else. If in in testing, there's such a thing as a variable and a constant. Something, you take something that's constant and you keep changing the, the variables until you find out this is the best way of doing it. Well, the Word of God is constant. And what is variable, though, is, you know what? It's us. We're variables. We change. God doesn't change. James says so. God never changes. But we change. So this morning, I'm going to look at a parable. A parable is something very simple. It's a, it's a, it's a story about something that we all know. And it's laid alongside. That's where the word parable means, that to bring it alongside of. It, he, lays this, he lays a parable, something that we all know, alongside of a spiritual truth, and that allows us to understand the spiritual truth. The parable I want to share with you in, in um, I guess I'll go to it in my Bible, is in Matthew 13, and it's the parable of the, we could call it the parable of the sword, the parable of, of the soil, which is really what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a parable about the four responses to the Word of God. Because the Word of God is alive. The Word of God always works. That means there's something wrong with us. So I want to know what that is. I want to know. And I want you to know. Because the Word of God is what gives life to us. So I want you to see one other thing before I go to where I want to go into Matthew. Mark also gave the exact same parable. So did Luke. But Mark adds something to it that I think is very important. I want you to know something. In Mark, chapter, in Mark chapter 4 and, four and verse 15, I want you to know something. Satan could care less about you. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to even destroy you unless you have the word of God in you. He isn't worried about you. Mark says in chapter 4 and verse 15, he says, when that word comes, Satan comes immediately for a purpose. You know what he wants? Not you. He wants the word. Because the Word has the, has the power of life in it to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. Satan hates God, he hates Jesus, and he hates anyone who looks like, acts like, or talks like Jesus. So he comes for the Word immediately, not later. He comes immediately before it can take up roots in your hearts. He doesn't want you to get conformed into the image. That's what I want to look at this morning in this parable of of, uh, Matthew 13. Now, Jesus gives the parable earlier. Then they come back and he says, I'm going to explain this parable to you now. Why? Because they couldn't understand it. So in in chapter 13, I'm going to be looking at these verses. And I like the way you do things here. I like a lot of things you do here. But, you know, you guys put one verse up on the screen at a time. Then where we are, we have this Bible program that I can't do that. I put, we hit, put like four or five up there at a time. I like it one verse at a time. It, un, unfortunately, it's rough on the guy in the booth. But 
I'm going to try to preach through this and, and uh, stick with me on it. Okay, here's this parable that Jesus Christ has given. And he's, he begins, and, he's, and he says to them, hear the parable of the sower. And here's, here's where it goes. Now, if you have ever had a garden, I'm not asking you to show hands. If you've ever done anything with a garden or planted a seed, this parable, you'll know exactly what he's talking about. Because this is, you, you know exactly, you know. I don't have to try to explain it to you. But he says, here's what happens. Hear the parable of the sower. Let me tell you something else about a parable. A parable normally has one truth in it. If you try to take a parable and make every word mean something, you're going to fall in a false doctrine. Because a parable normally has one major, one major truth, and everything goes toward that truth. Now, there's other things that come out of it, but don't try to make something where it's nothing. So the parable here, is, again, is about these responses to the Word of God, and it's Satan that is trying to get to the Word. Okay, he says, When anyone hears the Word of the kingdom... That's what we're, you've heard that this morning. You've heard that every Sunday you come here, you hear the word of the kingdom. Anyone who hears the, word of the, hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one, that's Satan, comes and snatches, it, snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. Real quick. The wayside is like if I threw seed up here on, this, up, up on here in this wood. Wayside's where the farmer walked in order to sow seed. And by the way, the sower according to Jesus himself, is the Son of God. However, in the day in which we live, you know who the sower is? Those people just stood up here and became members of this church. They're sowing the Word of God. You're sowing the Word of God. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit's is living inside of you, and that's the way God does things. You sow it. But in this case, Jesus says, I, the Son of Man is the sower in, in this parable. Satan is the one who's coming after it. So he says, now... That ground where the farmer walked every day, that's, that's as hard as this board. So these, the first type of seed and the first type of response is that when that seed is flown, thrown here where there is no soil, your heart is a soil, by the way, if that seed is sown up here, Satan comes immediately and takes it. You know, if you do that at home, you throw it. If you're throwing something out there and some, some birds come immediately and eat it. And that's what he's saying here. It's just like those birds coming and eating it. Satan comes immediately and snatches the word. Why? Because he doesn't want it to take root in your heart. He doesn't want you to begin taking that word and holding on to it. So when can he get it? Before it takes root. We, where I live, we live on property, and we're going to look at type soils. I've tried planting a garden. I get nothing. I'm serious. It's not funny, though. I get weeds. That's all I get. It's just weeds. And because the ground is just so poor. But he says here that that, that, wor that word comes and there's no, there's no root anywhere. It doesn't get a chance to make root. Why? Because you know what he says? Excuse me. Don't, don't, don't touch it. I'm okay. He says because he doesn't understand it. That's what he says. He says he comes and takes the word because the person doesn't understand it. You know what? You know what that means? It doesn't mean the word's too hard to, to, for you to grasp or understand. No. It means you don't want the word. You don't comprehend the fact that you need the word of God. That's what it means. When he says you don't understand it, it doesn't mean I, I'm not smart enough to understand this. No. He's saying you just don't want the word. You don't understand how important it is to your life, and therefore it means nothing to you, and you walk away just as if you never heard it. That's the first type of response to the Word of God. And I'm going to go through these rapidly because I want to show you something else. Then he says, the second type, but he who receives the Word on stony places. Now, my property at home, we have about this much soil. I'm not joking. And beneath it is shale and stone. Have you ever had soil like that? We have, when we start digging like my driveway, when you come down the driveway, there's stones sticking out of it. I'm not joking. And we've covered it with, with, with soil. It just comes back out again. We had, a, we had one of our water pipes break. They, they came in, dug it up. They said it got on a stone. There's nothing but stone down there. Well, he said this is a type of soil. This is the second response to the Word of God. It's like stony soil. He said he, he who receives the Word on stony places... This is he who hears the word. Now watch. Now here's, every, everyone's going to be, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word. What's the word? 
the seed. He said, he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Receives it with joy. You know what it means? Has emotion. Yeah, baby. I like that. I got emotion on that word he preached. That is good stuff. I even said amen four times on it. I'm emotional about this. You know, I'm emotional. I got, I got the emotion. Unfortunately, the word isn't doing much. It says he receives it with joy, but he has no root. No root. He endures for a while. Oh, yeah. The, it's like the grass at my house. It endures for a while. It can't go very far, though. No root. It's stones underneath of it. He said it's no root. He endures. But here's what happens. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the Word. Understand that. Satan comes immediately because of the Word. Trials and tribulations come immediately for a purpose, to get the Word out of you. And you only endure for a short time because you don't have any root. No root. you got emotions, baby. You're happy. You're showing joy. No root. No root. I'm going to talk about that in a second. No root in himself. For when the tribulation and persecution, because of the Word, he stumbles. But the Word, the word is teaching you how not to stumble. He stumbles. No root. No root. He only endures for a short time. Now, here's another one, though. It's the one around the th with the weed, the thorns. He who receives seed among the thorns, he hears the word. There it is again. Every one of them, they're hearing the word, folks. That means there's something wrong because the word has life in it. The word's the seed of God. The word has life. Show was those weeds, the briars, they choke. It says, he says, it chokes the word. What does? You know what the briars are? The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. They're weeds. They're weeds in the garden. They're weeds that are taking the word out of you. The cares of this world? Yeah. You'll get the word and you'll keep it for a while. You'll hold on to it. And then all of a sudden, the cares of this world, they'll come in and choke it. And you'll be saying, I, don't, I just don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I just, I, I listened to Joey this morning and, and he gave me this and talked about all these things. It was exciting. And look at my life. My life's a mess. I don't have enough money to pay this. My wife's left me. My son's left me. I, this is happening. My kids are on alcohol. The kids are doing this. He said, and all those cares of the world. You forget what Joey said. It comes in and chokes it. And the word of God is of non-effect. It's of non-effect. But it's not the word. It's not the word's fault. The word has life in it. It's us. It's us. But he said this last one. He said, but here's the other response to the word. But he who receives seed... Among the thorns, is he, excuse me, I'm going back where it was. He hears and he chokes, but then he who receives the seed on the good ground. What's the good ground? A heart that's prepared. You know, if, you're gonna, if you're going to do a garden, you've got to go out and prepare the ground. The, if, if, if you come to church in the morning, here's how you prepare the ground. Because here's, here's what he says. He says, he said, if... The ones who comes in on good ground, he hears the word. He understands it. That means he understands, hey, I, this word's for me. I know it's for me, baby. He's, he's, speak, he's reading my mail this morning. How Joey know this about me? He's reading my mail. He knows this word is for me this morning. I'm going to hold on to it. And it produces a hundredfold, 60, 30 times what, what you put into it. How do you do that? When you come to church in the morning, I'll tell you. Here, listen, here's, I'm serious. I'm not joking. I've been there. I've done this. When you come to church in the morning, here's what chokes the word out. Here's, here, here's what mean, this means you're not preparing the soil. You come in here, don't get upset with me. You have sin in your life. Unconfessed sin. See, when you have unconfessed sin, you'll sit here and you have, you have, you have a chip on your shoulder. Something's bothering you. And the word is having trouble getting into you. You gotta, you gotta get rid of that. It only takes 30 seconds. Lord, forgive me. I confess my sin to you, God. 
You're, you're faithful and just forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all right. There's, there's sin in you. Perhaps you're upset at somebody. You're un, you, you have unforgiveness towards somebody. It, the soil, the soil's not right. It's not, it's, the seed's going to have no place to go. It has nothing. Not the seed's fault. We're not preparing our hearts. Come to church. Be worshiping. Look, if you have a problem, say to, say to whoever, if, if you and your wife are having problems, listen, I don't mean bad problems. You, you all don't have bad problems because that guy back there said he's never had a problem in life with his wife. He's got to get over that sinning, but he has no problem with his wife. But, but listen to me. I'm joking, of course. But, but the, <clears throat> excuse me, I've preached two sermons this morning. This is my second hour, folks. So he, so what we have to do is we have to, we, we have, if you're having an issue, don't even discuss it. Stop discussing the issues. Say, look, I'm preparing my life right now to stand before God. I want to hear his word. And I want this, I want that word to take hold in my life and change me. And that's, that's, what, it, that's what the word does. Now listen to me. I said it's Satan that's doing it, and it's true. I could go to James and show you that there is a trying of your faith, and it's not Satan doing it. It's just a matter of going through this life, and there's things that test your faith. But here, we're, I'll stay with the parable. I'm not going to change the parable. This is Satan doing something to you. But listen, there's 100. Joey seats normally 150 people. I don't know how many is here. It, let's just say if there's 130 people here. That means when the Word of God goes out here on Sunday morning, and it goes out every Sunday, that means Satan has to send 30 demons, or 130 demons, to get the Word out of you. Man, that's a lot of work for those demons. He has to send 130 demons to get the, prevent that Word from taking seed in your life. However, Satan has a better plan. He really does. And the next parable, right after this one, in chapter 13 is Satan's better plan. And I want to tell you something. In America, this second plan is working for Satan. I want to get your attention. In America, this second plan is working for Satan. And I know it because I'm a pastor. I know it. It's working. It's something he doesn't have to worry about sending out 130 demons. He doesn't have to worry about that. Do you know Satan is a counterfeit, of course, right? He counterfeits whatever God does. Why? Because he wants to be God. He wants to be like God. Therefore, whatever God does, that's what he does. He just does it in a counterfeit way. But the best counterfeit, you can't tell the difference between the real thing. When you go to a bank, you know, here's how they... I used to be in law enforcement 100 years ago. And, but the, when a banker, the clerks... They're not trained to, to, to know what a counterfeit looks like. They're trained to know what the real thing looks like. And so when the, something bad comes along, they can find it and see it. Now listen, sometimes Christians want to study the counterfeit so bad, and they don't understand the real thing. When you know the Word of God, you know it when something comes by you that's not right. But you have to know the Word of God first. So, here's what, here's what goes on. So, I'm going to give you this, this way of Satan doing thing, which is, and, and it's going to make sense to you, except I want to make sure that you know this, because this is the methodology of Satan. This is his schemes. This is his methods. Okay? Here's what he does, and this is the very next parable, and that's why Jesus does it this way. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Yeah. Verse 24. Sowing good seed in the field. We're not going to go through this whole parable. I'm just going to get a couple points in, then I'm going to preach on it. He says, just like a man sowing good seed in his field. Yeah, that's good seed. But while men slept, now that doesn't mean physical sleep. It means spiritual sleeping. It's spiritual sleep. And a lot of times Christians are spiritually asleep. We get emotional, but they're spiritually asleep. He said, while, while men slept, the enemy, Satan, this is his better plan, right? This, remember, this, this pastor up there said up there that day, he said, this is Satan's best plan. This is his best plan. He doesn't have to do anything. 
This is his best plan. While men sleep, the enemy comes and he sows another crop, a counter crop. Except this crop is tares, T-A-R-E-S. You know what a tare is? A tare is a weed that looks identical to wheat, looks identical to it. You can't tell it apart until it grows. It looks just like the real thing, but it's worthless. It is worthless. Wait a minute. So he comes, while men slept, the enemy came and slowed, showed, sowed tares among the wheat and went his own way. And when the crane, grain had sprouted and produced crop, the tares also appeared. Now here's what, here's what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. Now understand me. Satan comes and puts tares or, or weeds in with the word of God. They're worthless. It's worthless. They do it because we're sleeping and we're not alert to the word of God, the real thing. We're sleeping. The church is asleep today, folks. And Satan is sowing tares in the church and we're buying it. It's counterfeit. The sowing or method, watch out. The sowing or method is not Satan. It's not Satan himself. Satan's doing the same thing God does. God uses Joey. God uses other men, people like you, to sow the word of to sow his word. He uses, God uses people. That's God's plan. Satan does the same thing. Watch, Satan does the same thing. He uses his own people. Not demons. Best is a person standing before your pulpit. Listen, don't you listen to a word I say if it's not in here. Amen. If it's contrary to the word of God, don't pay any attention to me. I'm serious. If I stand before you and tell you I know the entire word of God and I know it, run away from me because I don't know. It's easier for me to say I don't know than to try to make something up. False teachers. Oh, they look good. They sound good. They sow the word of God. It sounds like the word of God. They use, the, they use the name of Jesus every now and then. Must be good stuff. It's very similar to the real thing. But it's leaving just a little bit out. Just a little bit. Just a little bit, not a lot. They're not teaching the whole counsel of the Word of God. There's a hell, I believe it, but it's not eternal. Oh, I like that. Why? Because it tickles my ears. I like what he's saying. Let me tell you something. Peter says, you're not going to find it in there. Peter says that the prophecy of Scripture is of non-personal interpretation. You cannot. No one is to... You cannot have a personal inter interpretation of the Word of God. You know why? Because it's God's Word and you're not God. If I send you a letter, and it's, I write you a two-page letter, and I know you're going to show it to your friends, and I write things in there that you don't like, and, you, and I put stuff in there, you say, man, I can't show that to my friends. So you say this, and your wife says, just change it then. Okay. They change Erase this word, erase that word, type. You know, it's a, I send it to you by email. You can just shoot, just change it by uh, erasing a few words. You show it to your friends. Say, here's a letter from Tom. Unfortunately, it's not my letter anymore. It's your letter. You follow me? It's your letter. Same thing about God's word. If you change a word of it, if you change the meaning of something, it's not God's word. It's your word. It has no life in it. In fact, it has death in it. That is what Satan's doing. Satan has a sowing, and there are people who look like preachers, they sound like preachers, they have churches with good preaching names on them, and yet they're, yet they're sowing something that is not God's Word, and, the, and Satan doesn't have to do a thing to come out and take the Word, because there's no real Word being sown. That is Satan's best. See, his best is not, follow me, his Satan, this is Satan, his, not, his best is not to have alcoholics and druggies and those type people following him in his kingdom. No, 
His best, or politicians, nope, I didn't say that one, forget that one. His best is having people who look like good, upstanding citizens in this world. Every now and then they name the name of Jesus. They say, I believe in God. They're Satan's best because they're following Satan and they don't even know it. But they, he don't want, nobody's going to believe a guy who's, who's lying in a gutter drunk and says, hey, by the way, no, you're not. But this politician or these bankers or whoever, these people who have a little bit of reputation, they're listening to them. And that's who Satan likes in his kingdom. That's what he wants. It teaches the word, but it has no power in it. It sounds like the word. It has no life in it. It has death. You want to see it again? Matthew chapter 24. I believe with all my heart, I believe we're living in the end times. In fact, I don't have to say I believe it. The Bible says we're living in the end times. The end times began with, the, with Jesus Christ. We're living in the end times. The end times are going to keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Jesus calls them birth pangs, P-A-N-G-S, or pains. And if, if those of you who had babies, this see you men, you don't know anything about this, except you go with your wife to the hospital, and you see on that little blip, 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 and they're watching it, and the blips get higher and faster. And you're watching, the, you're watching that little machine, and your wife's going is screaming as the blips get higher. She's screaming. Why? Because the birth pains are getting worse and worse and getting faster and faster. Well, see, the, the closer we get to the end times, Jesus says to himself, the birth pains increase. And the birth pains are increasing right now in, in this world. Now look, Matthew 24. Jesus comes out of the temple. He, and the disciples, they're, they're hot on the temple. They love that temple. You know who built the temple? Herod. This is Herod's temple. Looks good, baby. Got gold in it. It is nice. They say to Jesus, you like this temple? This is a nice temple, isn't it? And Jesus says back to him, yeah, it's going to be destroyed. Day is going to come. It's not going to be one stone left on it. It happened in 70 AD. Yep, it's going to happen. He says, when will, well, when's this going to happen? The disciples said, they get him alone. They say, because see, they know he's, they, they want him to set up the kingdom. They want Jesus to set the kingdom up. That's all they're interested in, the kingdom. Before, remember, he was getting ready to be ascended back to heaven. They say, hey, when's the kingdom coming? Hey, that's what they're asking. And they, here's what they say to him in Matthew chapter 24. It's called the Olivet Discourse. Best teaching in the Bible except for the book of Daniel in the end times. They say to Jesus, they, they say, tell us when these things will be. Because he said there's not going to be one stone left on it. Here's how it got happened. Do you mind me telling you real quick? Titus goes through 70 AD. It goes through Jerusalem. He's fighting the Jews. The Jews all run into the temple. They said, we're getting into the temple. We'll be safe. The, uh, the leader of the army had told them, do not bother the temple. The boss doesn't want us bothering the temple. The Jews go into the temple. They throw fire in there to burn them up. Unfortunately, the fire sets the temple on fire. Gold begins going down between the big rocks. You know what the soldiers do? They want the gold. They tear every stone down trying to get to the gold. So every stone is torn down in the temple. They asked Jesus, they said, they said to him, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? One question. That's only one question. All oh, that's one question. Because they realize that his coming and the end of this age, because the kingdom will begin, what we call the millennial reign, will begin with that. So it's all one thing. They said, but here's what I want to tell you. They said, what will be the sign now, I went to Mount Airy High School, Mount Airy Elementary School, my, you know, so I'm not the sharpest tack in the, in the box. But I know that sign is singular and not plural. You with me? If it was plural, I know what the teacher told me. If it has an S next to it, it's plural. <laughs> so this doesn't have an S next, on, next to it because that means it's singular sign. Now, there's a whole lot of signs of the end times, and Jesus in Matthew 24 gives a whole bunch of them. But that's not what they're asking him. They're saying to him, what is the sign? Singular. Now, he's going to give them a whole bunch, but they all, they're all going to flow out of the main sign. He says to them, watch. Verse 14, I mean, verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, 
take heed that no one deceives you. First off, that sign has something to do with deception. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive you. Now, let me tell you something right now. If I stood here in front of you and said, by the way, I'm the Christ, I doubt if I would deceive you. Follow me? So, there's two things. Or there are people, though, who are coming saying, I am the Christ. There's going to be one coming who will say he's the Christ and they will follow him. The one called the Antichrist. Until he sets himself up in the temple saying he is God and they know then that they have been betrayed. But, Jesus says to them, he, he says to them, many will come, follow me now, many will come in my name saying, now, forget about the last part of that verse. I'm not getting rid of that because that's something else. Many will come in my name. You know what that also means? It means what I was just, getting ready, was just telling you about Satan's best. Many will come in my name. That means representing Jesus Christ. You know how I represent Jesus Christ? I say to you, welcome to our church this morning. Jesus Christ loves you this morning, and I'm here to teach you the word of God this morning. That's representing Jesus Christ. And then I teach anything I want to teach. I teach things that aren't true. But I name the name of Jesus every now and then. I preach, on his, on, I preach off of his reputation using his name. And I deceive you. That's what Jesus said. Many will deceive. You're going to be deceived. Because people are going to come in my name and you're not going to pay any attention to them. As far as making sure they're true. That's why... John says, try the spirituals to make sure they're real. Try the spirits to make sure it's real. Test it. Many will say, in that day, Jesus said, many, was gonna, many will say, and they'll be using the word of God and bandering it, and people will be in, and that's what's happening in America today, folks. I'm sorry to tell you that, but it's true. Listen, listen look at the major, I'm not going to name churches, look at the, the denominations, I'm talking about major denominations, that are walking away and taking things out of their doctrine because it doesn't fit the people and people are offended. If you can sit in this church with that man preaching and you're never offended, then you get better find another church because that man's going to offend you because the Word of God offends you. Amen. They walked away from Jesus. They... they Don't applaud me, because I'll, I'll begin thinking I'm good, and I know I'm not. But listen, I'm just joking. Listen, listen. They walked away from Jesus because they were offended. The word offends you. It's telling you. Listen, you know, the temple, it had a brazen laver. Priest, the high priest couldn't go in the, in the Holy of Holies until he went past the brazen laver. A brazen laver is something made out of bronze, and they fill it with water. What does he do? He stops there. He looks at himself in the brazen laver because it, it's a mirror in the bottom. The, bra the brass is so shiny, it's a mirror. And, and he looks in there and he sees himself. He sees, I'm dirty, I'm dirty. Man, he, has, he can't go before the Holy of Holies, can't go before God like that. What's he do? He washes his face, washes his hands all, with that water in the brazen laver. Yeah, then he goes in the Holy of Holies. You know why? Because God's Word will show you your dirt. God's word will show you your filth. God's word will show you your sin, but it contains the water of the washing of the word of God that cleanses you from sin. And Satan, Satan, Satan doesn't want that. So he will, he will give you a brazen labor, but there's no water in it. Satan does not want you to be cleansed and, and turn into the image of Jesus Christ. So here comes, it's, he, Jesus says they're going to come in my name, using my reputation. They're going to speak my words, but it's not real. Satan knows the word of God. Listen, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Don't, I won't go much longer because I can't talk any longer, but let me tell you something. Satan, I, I, believe, it was, I believe it was Satan who went to before uh, Eve. I don't think it was a, a, a serpent. But that's okay. That's Tom Gu. It's worth nothing except that's my opinion. I would tell you why later. It's not important. But I believe it was Satan himself. 
but he goes before Eve. Now, God has already told Adam, the man, the woman, woman hadn't been named Eve yet, by the way, so I'm calling her Eve just so you know who she is. She was named Eve after the sin. But anyway, he tells Adam, you can eat of any tree in the garden, anything you want, but you can't eat of that tree over there because the day you eat thereof, you shall die. He told Eve, now here comes the devil along. Going to test her. Going to check that word out. I'm going to get that word out of her as fast as I can get it out of her. He did not. Now, don't walk out yet. He did not deny God. He did not even attack God. He never said to her, there is no such thing as God. Didn't dare say that. If he would have said that, you know what she would have done? She would have said, get out of here. And he'd have had to leave. No, he didn't attack God at all. What did he do? He attacked the word. He said, did God really say that? Did God really say that you would die if you ate of that tree? That's the most ridiculous thing ever. He didn't say that, but that's what goes to her mind. Whoa, did God really say that? I don't know. What's he after? The word. He's not attacking God. He's not that foolish. These, these false teachers, preachers, whatever you want to call them, they're not going to attack God himself and say there's no such person as God. There's no such person as Jesus Christ. They just won't teach the word. Stick with this man sitting here. They're not teaching the word. That's what Satan did. And Eve, the woman, bought it. She believed him. It was no longer, no longer God's word. Why? Because Satan left some of it out. Or you're going to be smart, okay. You're going to, in fact, you're going to be smart as God when you eat that. Sounds good to me. But he left it out. He got her, he, he convinced her. That part about death doesn't have anything to do with it. No, people. People. America is going down the drain because we walked away from God. And the churches in America, not all, not even the majority, but it doesn't take many, you know what I mean? It doesn't take many to leaven a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It doesn't take many. When, when Joey preaches, when I preach, I hope, we try to do two things. We try to use God's word. I told you to, that the word of God is of no private interpretation. P Peter said that. I can't interpret the word by my opinion. I can interpret the word with more word. Why? Because it's God's word. There's other word that teaches it to me. Anything in here I don't understand, if I can't find it elsewhere in the Bible, guess what? Then I might as well not teach on it because God is not necessary. The only thing that's necessary for you to know, everything in the Bible is not there to tell you every question, answer every question you have. The Bible is here to show you what Jesus Christ has done for you to redeem you from hell. That is what the purpose of the Bible is. So don't worry about where Cain get his wife or whoever. Don't, or don't worry about those things. It's not in there. I can tell you, but it's not in there. Now, Listen to me, though. Joey teaches, I teach. We do want to help you interpret the Bible, though. We'll tell you, interpretation just simply means understanding what it means, understanding it. And so, not the way that that other guy meant, where he, uh, where he said that they understand it not. No, that means you don't want the word, period. When we talk about interpretation, we're talking about we're telling you, here's what, here's what it means, here's what God is telling us. Now, there's such a, also, we try to put application in it. We want to give you application. Application just means we're telling you how this word affects your life. But listen, the greater application, the greater application is, I, I don't care, but I don't want the people getting hurt. The, the greater application, and they're not going to pay me if it makes noise, Jerry told me. But if the greater application is what you do with the word of God, listen to me. Nobody here agrees with abortion. Yet, we're guilty of spiritual abortion. Look, the Word of God has life in it. The Word of God can change you. And if we do not apply the, the Word to our lives, we're aborting the Word of the life that it wants to give us. A spiritual abortion because we're not applying it to our lives. You know how you apply it? Be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves, James would say. 
If we don't do that, we've aborted the word. Satan has defeated you. Defeating. Let me ask you something. I'm way off my notes, Joey. I apologize. Listen to me. Why do I say listen to me? You don't have any choices. Things make a noise. <laughs> listen. Listen. The, listen. I'm sorry. Sp I forgot what I was going to say. Listen. Spiritual warfare. You know what spiritual warfare is? If you've been here very long, I'm sure Jerry, uh, Jerry, Joey has told you what spiritual warfare is. Spiritual warfare, listen, spiritual warfare is for the Word of God. It is. It's not about you physical. Spiritual warfare is to protect the Word of God in you. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because, uh, uh, I'll tell you how I know it. <clears throat> I, this is rough. For, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, verse 4, do I have that? I do, I don't. Okay, I'll just quote it to you. I don't, I, I apologize to you. Chapter 10, uh, chapter 10 of, of 2 Corinthians, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. What strongholds? The verse before it talks about knowing God. The strongholds are the strongholds in your mind that you have to pull down to allow the Word of God to get into your heart, and that is spiritual warfare. Look at all the weapons of the spiritual warfare, and you'll see that they all have to do with the mind and your thought life. And the, wor the spiritual warfare then is to protect the Word of God that is in you because Satan is coming to destroy you to get to that Word. That's what he wants. The Word of God is powerful, folks. It's powerful. It is powerful. What is it? I'll tell you what it does for you. This is it for me. I'm, I'm serious. My voice is gone. That's why Joey brought me up here. I told him I won't be a preacher over a half hour. He said, you're my man. And, but, but listen, the, the, here's what the Word of God does for you. Listen, this is changing. This is life changing, what I'm about to say to you. I bet you he's already preached it, but that's okay. See, I don't mind coming here and preaching the same thing that Joey just preached. I don't know what he preached, but I don't mind. Because the Holy Spirit places us in remembrance. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Listen, Corinth, uh, Ephesians, my favorite book in the Bible. Here's what the Word of God does to you. Paul wrote this book of Ephesians, and in, in verse 18, before we get to where I want to go, verse 18 says, he's praying for us, and he says, I want you to understand. I want your eyes to be opened. I want you to know what I'm telling you. He's not praying for you to get this. He's saying, I want you to know what you already got. I want you to know this is what you have. And then in 19, he says, I want you to know the exceeding greatness of his power, God's power, to us who believe. Now, I love the word working. Why? Because he says it over and over again. It means, it means energy, the energy of God. He says, I want you to know the working, this, this power. This, let me say something. You know the greatest miracle in the Bible? You know the greatest demonstration in the, of God's power in the Bible? It's not creation. It's not the Red Sea. It's Jesus Christ's resurrection. He's saying, look, he's saying it. He says, I want you to know the exceeding not just the greatness, the exceeding greatness of His power, God's power, toward us who believe, according to the working, there's that word working again, of His mighty power, there it is again, which He worked, there it is again, and um, there's a reason for my madness, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, not only what's his name this world, that is what is to come. He's put all power under his feet. He's given all power to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who filleth all in all. What's he saying, though? He's saying this resurrection power, it's in you. It's in you. He's saying, I want you to know the greatest power that was ever demonstrated in the world is, Christ, is God raising Jesus from the dead, the resurrection power, and it's in you. It's in you. Paul said in the book of Philippians, to know Christ. And, 
and the power of His resurrection. You know what the word know there means? It means to experience it. And that's what it means here. When Paul in verse 18, which is not on the board for you, he says that you would know. He said that you experience it. Not, not up here. Experience it in doing the power of God. The resurrection power. Why is it so great? But there's other, there were people raised from the dead in the Old Testament. Jesus raised people from the dead, but it wasn't resurrection power. You know why? Because they died again. Resurrection, people don't die. Only Jesus Christ has had resurrection power. No one else. I mean, I'm talking about the death part. Resurrection means there's no more death holds him. Because you know who had the power of death? Satan. Still has it, by the way. Because Scripture says this, that death is the last the last enemy to be placed under the feet of Jesus. Jesus, it has no power over Jesus, but we still have physical death. But it has no power, power over us anymore because physical death to us is just asleep. But Jesus, Jesus, death couldn't hold him. That means Satan couldn't hold him. Nobody else had ever been raised from the dead to never die again. Lazarus, he died again. They all died. They were, ra- they were raised from the dead, but they weren't resurrected. They had no resurrection life in them. But that's not all about this resurrection life. In chapter 3 of the same book of Ephesians, excuse me, in the same book of Ephesians, I think they turned me off. In the same book of Ephesians, <laughs> chapter 3, Paul says, Now to him, now to him who is able to do something, to, listen, look at his words. He's able to do the same thing. Blah, 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 blah. I'd be happy if it just said, I would be happy as a lark if that just said, now to him who is able to do all that we ask or think. Wouldn't that be great? That would be good for me. It's just as if he says, he's able to do anything you ask him, all you ask or think. Nope. No, he didn't say that though. I'd be happy if he just said, he was able to do above all that you can ask or think. I'd like that. I like that. I would like it. No, but he didn't even say that. He said, I'd be happy if he said, now to him is able to do abundantly above all we ask or think. No, he didn't even say that. He said, exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think. How? Because the next verse says something. (gasps) Maybe we don't have the next verse. According to the power, what power? The resurrection power that God worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and set him at his, set him at his own right hand far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name is named in this world, not only is what shall come, and placed all things under his feet and given all things to the church, his body, which is the fullness of him, fill of all and all. That power that works in us is resurrection power, and that is what you should have operating in you today. And Satan would have no power over you because he can't touch Jesus Christ. Anyway, I'm sorry about all that. I want to say something else, but I know I have one more thing real quick, real quick, real quick. I'm finishing. Does Joey ever say I'm finishing? Don't ever believe a pastor says I'm finishing. (laughs) Their door must have a, a, one of those really slow things because pastors are famous for that. I'm finishing. He closed his Bible. He must be finished. No. Uh, yeah, I'm finished. Listen, you know, here's what you do. No, I'm serious. Here's, what, here's the way you do it, folks. It's, it's, I hope you all set your clocks back. It's just 3 o'clock, Joey. Whoa. So it's 2 o'clock, isn't it? Tell me the truth. Don't do that to me. <laughs> listen, th- listen. I think he did that on purpose. He said he won't preach long. Leave the clocks alone. <laughs> so, but listen. <laughs> that didn't work. Listen, I don't know. What did I give you? I gave you another verse in Timothy. Timothy. Look at Timothy. <laughs> listen. No, that's not what I wanted. Is that what I gave you? I apologize. That's a good verse, though, but that's not what I wanted. It's my fault. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. 
That's not it, is it, sweetheart? I gave you the wrong chat. Did, did Joey give you that? Okay, the verse I was looking for is, is 2 Timothy, of course. But it's, Timothy says, to guard the word which is implanted in you by God. That's what he says. Guard the word which is implanted in you by God. And he says, the last side, the civishness, the last, you know why? Because those things are weeds that come up and steal the word from you. He said, guard it. Guard the word. Guard it, folks. When you walk out of here, I am shutting up honest, I promise you. When, when, when you walk out of here, listen, when you walk out, Satan's going to want the word out of you. You're going to walk out and get in your car. I'm not trying to be funny. You're going to walk out and get in your car. Maybe the car doesn't start. You're going to go out and get in the car. You forgot to get gas. You've got to get gas somewhere. You're riding down the road. You say to your wife, I forgot to get gas. She said, if you weren't drive so fast, you wouldn't be having to get gas all the time. The word, weeds are coming up, baby. They're growing. Where's the kids? I don't know. Oh, more weeds coming up. Listen, it doesn't take much. You understand me? Satan will bring tribulation, persecutions, testings to try to steal the word. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. God's conforming you into his image. You have a job in this king. Listen, you know what? Jesus Christ came to do one thing, to reveal the Father to us. He did. He sent the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus to us. Our job in this world, in this land... Our job is to do the same thing that Jesus Christ did. And that is to reveal Jesus, though. He reveals the Father. We reveal Jesus to them. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'll reveal the Father to you. But we reveal, people, we reveal Jesus to people. Don't let Satan take the word from you. The word is alive in you. Don't lose it, folks. It's a difference between life and death. It's the difference between life and death. It's life and death. God. Father, I'm going to let Joey come in a second and pray for you. I just want to pray real quick. Ask your forgiveness for me going so long. Father, Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you for this church, Father. I thank you for this man of God who teaches them, Father. And Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. I ask that you would touch people here this, this morning, this afternoon, Lord. I ask, Lord, that, that as they walk out the door, the trials will come. Maybe not now. Maybe they, maybe they have enough soil there in their hearts, Lord, that it's going to take days. But it will come, Father. Lord, I pray that they would stand. And having done all to stand, that they stand, Lord. Lord, I pray. And Lord, as... As Satan has sifted Peter, and they try to, he try, they try to sift these, but Lord, let them stand. They're yours, Father. They're yours. And Lord, I pray, as Joey has already prayed for these people, if there's a need here, Lord, right now, the Word of God is alive. The Word of God is working in them. Lord, it's healing, then healing come in the name of Jesus. Lord, if it's, it's a, if it's emotional problems, healing and peace come in the name of Jesus. Alive in them, Father. Holy Spirit, move among your people and touch them. In the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for just for the opportunity to just speak. Uh, hopefully your word and anything I added to it or detracted from it, Lord, I ask your forgiveness. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed one more time.
if that word that was spoken got in your heart and you need to do some business with God, we just want to give you an opportunity right now. First of all, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then that word is uh, knocking at your door, the door of your heart. Or if you had the word and maybe Satan snatched it and um, you're back here and you're hearing it again and you need to make a decision to receive the word back, receive Christ back in your heart. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray with you if there's someone here who, who needs to make that decision. You need to get right with God. Anybody here before we move on? Amen. I'm going to trust that everybody is right with God here. But there's another uh, thing that we have to ask and that's if you are here and you are serving the Lord, but perhaps there are some tears, some, uh, some things getting in the way and trying to choke the word. We want to come against that today so that you, the, you would be fruitful and productive in the kingdom of God. If that has happened and is happening to you, it happens to all of us because of the way the world is, uh, functions. And today you want to come against that so that it will be a pure seed growing in you and producing the fruit of the living God in you. If that's you, raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you. Yes, there's hands all over the building. Thank you. Yes, yes, I see your hands. Let's pray. Father, Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, O oh God, for the living word, O oh God, the living word, O oh God, that you gave us, that lives in us, O oh God, and keeps us. Lord God. And Lord, here's the thing. You are the word. Lord, having you in us is having the word. Oh God, you are the living word, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray, oh God, Lord, for anything that would want to distract or pull away or water down, oh Lord God, or choke out, Lord God, we come against all of those things in the name of Jesus, oh God. And we pray, Father, for good soil, Oh, Lord God, for the good seed to grow, Lord, and produce a crop 40, 60, and 100 fold, oh, Lord God, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, thank you, oh, Lord God, for your word. Thank you that it's a cleansing word, oh, God. And anything that has to be washed away from us, God, right now we pray that you do that, God, that you cleanse us with the living word, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you and we praise you and we ask these things. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, amen, amen. How many are thankful for the word? Let's give the Lord a...